Hello everyone. The first slide I'm showing you here is the medial surface of the mandible. Now, as you can notice on the medial surface of the ramus of mandible, you appreciate a foramen, and that foramen is the mandibular foramen. Now, this mandibular foramen, via this mandibular canal, it leads outside as a mental foramen. So, the nerves and vessels entering inside, they will also emerge out as a mental nerve and the vessels and supplying the skin of the chin region. The nerves and vessels entering through this foramen are inferior alveolar nerve and inferior alveolar vessels. Inferior alveolar nerve, as you know, it's a branch of the posterior division of the mandibular nerve. Mandibular nerve posterior division is having three branches, auriculotemporal, lingual, and one is inferior alveolar. And the blood vessel, that is inferior alveolar vessels, are the branches of first part of maxillary artery, which will all enter through this. And as we said, they will come out through the mental foramen. So that is about the first slide here, showing the medial surface of ramus of mandible. And you can see the foramen on that, that is mandibular foramen. The second slide that I'm showing you here is the slide for the extensor compartment of the forearm. Now, as you can see, all the muscles on the extensor compartment of forearm, and if you look at the lateral most muscle present there, is usually confused with the brachioradialis muscle when you see it from the dorsal aspect. Brachioradialis, yes, it is the muscle of the posterior compartment. It is supplied by the radial nerve, but you can appreciate the brachioradialis more from the lateral side or from the anterior side where you see it is covering the radial artery and the superficial branch of the radial nerve. So when you see the dorsum of the forearm, you need to be careful by looking at the muscle, whether it is reaching the styloid process or it is going all the way to the base of the metacarpals. In this case, this muscle, you can see it is going all the way down and this muscle is extensor carpi radialis longus, one of the muscles supplied by the radial nerve, that is extensor carpi radialis longus. So just be careful about it. This muscle here is ECRL. When you see it from the lateral aspect or maybe from the anterior aspect, then you will see a muscle that is brachioradialis muscle. So you need to look at the insertion part here and then identify the muscle. Now, this is a picture in which you can see the dorsum of the hand and you can see some areas which are shown with the different uh, colors showing the different nerve supply. Uh, the area which is supplying toward the lateral two and a half side or sometime maybe three and a half as well, except the distal phalanx or you can say till the middle phalanx only, that is by the radial nerve. No mind it, it is by the radial nerve, it is not by the posterior interosseous branch of radial nerve. It is by the superficial branch of the radial nerve, which you can see as a lateral most content in the cubital fossa, and then which goes deep to the brachioradialis, passing superficial to the anatomical snuff box, and then comes into the dorsum of the hand and supplying the skin. So this highlighted region here in the yellow color is by the superficial branch of the radial nerve and not by posterior interosseous. Here in the next section, you're looking at an MRI, which is showing you the ventricles, the anterior horn of the ventricle, lateral ventricle can be seen, and you can also appreciate the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. Now, if you look at this structure, this thin structure, which is separating the, the ventricle, that is a septum pellucidum, a translucent septum, which is separating the two lateral ventricle. And the structure which is asked here, the arrow, that structure, which you see in the free margin of the septum pellucidum, and that is also forming the roof of the third ventricle is the fornix. So you're looking at the column of the fornix in this picture and not the pineal gland, mind it. Pineal gland will be seen somewhere behind in the posterior relation of the third ventricle and that section obviously will be quite below. So it is the uh, for column of the fornix which you are appreciating here. The pineal gland which some people were confusing with would be seen in the posterior part, very much posterior part and that too in the posterior relation of the third ventricle. Now, in this section, in this dissection of the hand, we are looking at the intrinsic muscles of the hand. Now, you can see the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus muscle there. And arising from the tendon of flexor digitorum profundus are the lumbrical muscles. Now, we got four lumbricals, as you can see by these arrows. The two yellow arrows are showing you the two lateral lumbricals, which are unipinnate. They arise only from one side of the tendon. And then the two black arrows there, they are showing you the bipinnate lumbricals, the third and fourth lumbrical, the medial two. The lateral two lumbricals, which are unipinnate, they are supplied by the median nerve, whereas the la medial two lumbricals, the one which are present toward the medial side, and the bipinnate one, they are the ones supplied by the ulnar nerve, by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve. So four lumbricals we can see here, the two lateral lumbricals, unipinnate by the median nerve, and the two medial lumbricals, which are bipinnate, they are supplied by the ulnar nerve. Next, we are looking at a sagittal section and in the sagittal section, this MRI is showing you about the different part of the brain. 
the one which is asked is a simple one it's the cerebellum everyone can identify that is cerebellum the the typical arrangement of the white matter of the cerebellum called as the arbor vitae that fern like arrangement can actually help you identify the cerebellum in any section doesn't matter if it's striatal or transverse or coronal so that probably is the easiest thing to identify in the mri or ct that is the cerebellum in case of the brown sequoid syndrome let's understand some sensory deficit in case of the brown sequoid syndrome now let us say this is a section of the spinal cord and here's the midline the spinothalamic tract are the one which decussates in the spinal cord and then ascend upward whereas the dorsal column tracts are the one which decussate which decussates in the middle oblongata so when you see in the spinal cord the tracts will be seen running on the ipsilateral side so let's say guys this here is the dorsal column tract which you can see ascending upward and then going and relaying into the the nuclei of the dorsal column tract present in the medulla called as the fasciculus gracilis and cunitus and the nucleus being nucleus gracilis and cunitus whereas the spinothalamic tract on the other side the spinothalamic tract will decussate at the level of spinal cord although it will take 2 to 3 segment to decussate but it decussate at the level of the spinal cord and then it ascends upward to reach the brain stem and there on continues to relay into the, the thalamus as we know the dorsal column tract is carrying the fine touch the conscious proprioception the vibration stereognosis so there will be a loss of all those sensation below the level of the lesion and let's say in case of brown sequoid syndrome if this is the area affected so below that level on the ipsilateral side you will see the loss of the proprioception loss of the uh, the vibration sensation and all whereas the main thing which is carried by the spinothalamic tract is the pain and temperature so there will be contralateral loss of pain and temperature below the level of the lesion now that's the main point there is a contralateral loss of pain and temperature below the level of the lesion where the brown sequoid syndrome is seen well this again is an easy one the question is about the dermatome of the umbilicus uh, i i believe that this question can only be confusing to certain people if the level of the umbilicus is asked so be careful about it if the level of umbilicus is asked it is obviously not t10 the dermatome of umbilicus is t10 but the level of the umbilicus is between the l3 and l4 vertebrae so l3 l4 please remember it's the vertebral level of the umbilicus but obviously the dermatome of the umbilicus is t10 in this image you are looking at the occipital bone and you are also looking at the atlas and the axis vertebrae now the two important joints we need to look here one is the atlanto occipital joint atlanto occipital joint is a type of a uh, ellipsoid joint and this joint allows the the side flexion movement and slight nodding movement like the yes movement is done at the atlanto occipital joint whereas the atlanto axial joint which is found between the atlas and the axis which is found by the odontoid process of the of the second cervical vertebrae that joint is called as atlanto axial and it is a type of a pivot joint and we know that pivot joint allows the rotatory movement so it allows the rotation of the atlas around the axis and helps in this movement which is a side to side movement or you can say it is a no movement which is done at the atlanto axial joint so atlanto occipital for the yes movement and atlanto axial is for the this no movement taking place well the next slide here is about the muscles which are derived from the first pharyngeal arch now to understand the muscles derived from that particular arch it's very easy you just need to remember that what nerve is supplying it the first pharyngeal arch in human it is supplied by the two nerves the main nerve is called as a post traumatic nerve and that is the mandibular nerve whereas a pre traumatic nerve which is derived from the facial that is cauda tympani because it joins the lingual nerve which is branch of mandibular so first arch is having two nerve one is a pre traumatic nerve which is cauda tympani and the main nerve of the arch is the mandibular nerve the first arch is also called as a mandibular arch so as we know cauda tympani nerve it's a mixed nerve it is secret secretomotor to the submandibular and sublingual gland and it is also carrying the taste sensation from the anterior two third of tongue so not any other muscle is supplied by this nerve but mandibular nerve the muscles which are supplied by the main mandibular nerve will be considered as the muscles of the first pharyngeal arch like all the muscles of mastication will come the two tensor muscle the tensor velli palatini the tensor tympani are also will be considered the muscle of the first arch because they are supplied by the trunk of mandibular and when the mandibular nerve divides into the anterior and the posterior division one of the branch from posterior division that is inferior alveolar nerve gives of a branch which comes down called as nerve to mylohyoid and that supplies the muscles in the oral diaphragm region that is the mylohyoid as well as the anterior belly of digastric so all these muscles because they are all supplied by the mandibular nerve so they are all muscles of the first arch they are all muscle derived from the first arch 
Now, talking about the artery which is involved in the Wallenberg syndrome or the lateral medullary syndrome, well, according to the, uh, the National Institute of the Neurological Disorder and Stroke, the artery which is involved in the Wallenberg syndrome is either the main trunk of the vertebral artery or the branch of the vertebral artery that is posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the PICA, the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is supplying the posterior lateral part of the medulla oblongata. So next, let's talk about the Frey syndrome. Now, as we know, Frey syndrome is a, is a, uh, a surgical complication in the accidental injury to the auriculotemporal nerve. Now, when the auriculotemporal nerve regenerates, as we know, it, it sometimes fuses with some other nerves like great auricular nerve, sometimes with the buccal nerve also. But most commonly, it fuses with the great auricular nerve. But the question here is about that in Frey syndrome, the injury is to which nerve? So the injury is to the auriculotemporal nerve, which is a branch of trigeminal nerve. Now, please understand that although parotid gland secretomotor fibers are coming from the glossopharyngeal nerve, but glossopharyngeal nerve is not reaching the gland. The gland always receives its post-ganglionic innervation from the trigeminal only. You will see all these facial nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve or even the oculomotor nerve. They will reach till their respective parasympathetic ganglion. But from the ganglion, like in this case, it's a utic ganglion, till the gland, the nerve which is reaching there and supplying is, is the branch of trigeminal. And in this case, it is auriculotemporal nerve which supplies the parotid gland and auriculotemporal nerve is one of the branch from the posterior division of mandibular nerve. And lastly, about the internal capsule. Well, internal capsule, which is uh, forming a major chunk of the white matter of the cerebrum. The white matter of the cerebrum, as we know, can be divided into the association fibers, commissural fibers, and the projection fibers. Association fibers being those fibers which are connecting the different areas of the cerebral hemisphere, but they are running in the same cerebrum. Whereas the commissural fibers, like the best example being the corpus callosum, Cor commissural fibers are connecting the same areas, at least the functionally same areas in both cerebral hemisphere. And internal capsule, which is the best example for the projection fiber, it is an example of projection fiber. The projection fibers in which the fibers are either going towards the cortex or they're going away from the cortex. So all the corticopetal and the corticofugal fibers are the one which are present, present inside the internal capsule. And that's why it is an example of the projection fiber. So internal capsule is a type of a projection fiber. 